Wall Street Wrap-Up is supported by Bamboulas, featuring live music. And now, tapas and wine upstairs. Bamboulas, the heartbeat of Frenchman Street. This week on Wall Street Wrap-Up, the Federal Reserve had their meeting to raise or lower interest rates we all pay from credit cards to home mortgage loans. We'll tell you what the Federal Reserve decided. And the government today released the unemployment figures for last month and where are the jobs? We'll tell you that too. Boeing's problems are going from bad to worse, from doors flying off in mid-flight to planes on fire while in the air. So what's happening to Boeing? And are the friendly skies becoming less friendly? Tonight, we'll be talking with Mike Boyd. Mike is the president and CEO of Boyd Group International. He's an aviation expert who's testified before Congress on aviation safety and procedures. And you may not know this person, but she has a $100 million business while working as a civilian for the U.S. Army. You're not going to believe this story. We've got a lot to cover for the next 28 minutes, so join us because this is Wall Street Wrap Up. Hi, and welcome. I'm Andre Laborde. Well, this week, the Federal Reserve met for the first time this year and left interest rates unchanged at five and a quarter percent rate as before. But then through cold water on the stock market, when Chairman Jay Powell said that their next March meeting, the lowering of interest rates would be probably off the table. Well, that, that sent the markets down, even though the percentage of market movers who really thought they would be moving it lower in March was minimal anyway. Now, this data, along with today's release of the Bureau of Labor Statistics of January's Jobs and Unemployment Report, and the non-farm payrolls was much higher than expected to just over 350,000 jobs added for last month. And the unemployment rate and the labor participation rate stayed as the month before at 3.7 percent and 62.5 percent. A strong jobs report telegraphed that the Federal Reserve will probably keep interest rates the same in March with the fear of inflation going higher. So how did our money do this week? Well, big tech had big gains with 52-week highs for Amazon, Adobe, Walmart, and for Meta. The Dow Jones and the S&P 500, they closed at record highs today, and it was the fourth straight positive week for both of the stock indexes. And this week, Dow Jones, they closed up for the week at 1.4%. And the S&P 500, they also closed up higher, same at 1.4%. And the NASDAQ, they closed today up just under 1.2%. Well, even after Meta's CEO Mark Zuckerberg was grilled this week in front of the Senate, Meta, formerly Facebook, released their fourth quarter earnings and they triple their profits from fourth quarter earnings of 2022. Now, Meta is up just under 29.5% from the beginning of the year. Walmart's board of directors agreed for a three-for-one stock split as shares are at an all-time high. The stock split is scheduled for this February the 26th. And this week, Boeing Aircraft released their fourth quarter earnings, and in light of their troubles with doors coming off in midair and finding loose bolts and other safety production issues on their MAX 9s, they're postponing the earnings guidance for this first quarter. Airline mishaps have been occurring more frequently lately, and from just last week, in fact, in Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport, a Delta flight lost their nose wheel just before taking off. And this week, two ex-Boeing staffers said that, that they would not fly the 737 MAX because of Boeing, they were being pressured to rush the planes out the door. And the FAA is telling Boeing that the 737 MAX planes need to be inspected after the last MAX 9 incident. So just how friendly are the friendly skies? So what's going on with Boeing? Well, Mike Boyd, he is president and CEO of Boyd Group International. He's an expert on airline travel. He spoke in front of Congress on airline safety and procedures. And best of all, he's going to speak with us tonight. Hi, Mike. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap Up. My honor to be here, sir. Mike, about a week ago, we had 
in, in Atlanta airport, and it was a Delta, I want to say Delta Flight 982, the nose wheel comes off the plane right before the, the plane was to take off to go to Bogota, Colombia. Are the wheels coming off of Boeing? No, we got we to gotta be very careful here. What, what happened with Alaska Airlines and since has to do with manufacturing. What happened with Delta on the runway at Atlanta, that has to do with maintenance at an, air, air, at an airline that really has nothing to do per se with Boeing. But this kind of news the airline industry does not need right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a cracked windshield here, a return there. I mean, one airplane returned because somebody bit the flight attendant. Well, talking about Alaska Air with the with the incident with the with the door coming off, uh, with Alaska Air, the fuselage was made by Spirit Spirit Aerosystem, and and by the way, I I don't want that to. Con I know you know this, but many of our viewers, when you, we hear Spirit, there's Spirit Air and the Spirit Aero Systems, which is completely two different companies. Um, but at one time, to my understanding, Spirit Aero Systems was a part of Boeing. Well, when they spun it off, do they have the amount of oversight now as they did possibly before? Well, keep in mind, airplanes, a lot of airplane manufacturing is, is outsourced. Spirit Aero Systems, and full disclosure, we've done work for those folks. You know, they're now in the business of doing uh, component work for more than just Boeing. We used to be Boeing aircraft manufacturing, and they spun that off. But the thing is, whenever you have a contractor, you have to stay on top of it. In, a case, in this case, apparently, we're talking about the Alaska Airlines thing, uh, Spirit pretty much is guiltless on this one because it looks like when Boeing got the airplane, they took the thing off, put it back on, and decided not to use bolts. Uh, so it really is in, in the lap of, of uh, Boeing, not Aerosystems. Are there, at, at Boeing, or like you say, you used to work at, with Spirit, I mean, are there checks and double checks? Like, would you say, let's say it came from Spirit, and when they put the, the bolts on, they didn't tighten the bolts up. Is there, what type of um, checks and balances are there? Well, you know, people don't realize this, but air, airline maintenance and airplane maintenance, you have the mechanic who does a job, really the technician, mechanic doesn't even describe it anymore. And then you have an inspector, that's a senior mechanic, that looks and, and signs off on the work. That that keeps us relatively safe as long as the inspector and the mechanic are not one and the same, or the inspector isn't at lunch when the job is done. Someone didn't check something, but it's not about bolts. It's not about a door that came off. It's about the system that allowed that to happen. Do you talk to people still in the talk to people in the airline industry? What about their morale? Is it is there a, a deep a deep seated reason that this is occurring more now maybe than before? Well, you know we haven't had this problem really before in the news. We don't have that problem with Airbus. We haven't seen much of Airbus. I'm sure they have their own little uh, things to deal with. But the problem we have with Boeing, we're looking at a track record now. This isn't the first time we found out on the Max that something wasn't screwed on tight. Uh, this isn't the first time with the Max we haven't found out a number of manufacturing issues. We've got to get to the bottom of that piece of it. And, you know, again, I will tell you this. Is it safe to fly? Remember, we have pilots unions out there. And, yeah, they get feisty across the bargaining table. But when they're not across the bargaining table... They're head deep into safety. So if a pilot at American Airlines or Southwest or United gets into the cockpit and wants to fly the airplane, I'll buy a ticket. Maybe it was a month ago, maybe two months ago. Again, Alaska Airlines, the co-pilot on a flight wanted to crash the plane. And fortunately, I think the pilot, the, the, the captain over uh, took over the, the flight. But later, the, he, the co-pilot admitted, well, I was on psychedelic mushrooms. Um, I, I know that's a rarity, but still, if you're on that packed flight, that's a, that's a problem. Well, keep, this was, this was a, a jump seat rider. This is a guy who was sitting in the jump seat behind oh, the okay. pilot and co-pilot. Okay. And that's normal. That's normal. But apparently, he had had some kinds of chemical that caused him to go wacko. That's a one-off. But of course, every airplane accident is a one-off. So uh, it's something people say, how did he get in there? He was supposed to be there. That was, of course, for him to be sitting in that cockpit. But the thing is, we can't control right now is human nature. There are humans that do squirrely things. I mean, even to the point of we saw it in, with Egypt, Egypt Air and a German air, 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 airline a couple of years ago where the person in the cockpit just went bonkers and decided to crash the airplane. 
I don't know how we fix that. I remember before all of this was occurring, I remember one of the financial shows that uh, Dave Calhoun, who is the CEO of Boeing, he was touting Boeing Aircraft's um, DEI program, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. But it's it, it just interesting that now all this going on, and as many times that Dave Calhoun has been on shows and being quoted now, they're not talking about DEI. Now, in fairness, other airlines are all having their DEI programs as well. Is But equity is different than merit. Do you think that there's a, a reason there that that CEOs want to be, be politically correct? So they, they bring in these type of programs, but does merit f fall by the wayside of equity? Well, keep in mind, it's, it's a grand idea. It's a good idea. But too much of this is virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, in the annual report, they're going to three pages of this stuff. I'm not concerned with that. All I want is the best qualified person to be looking at that air traffic control screen or the best, the best qualified person in the cockpit. Airlines are not in the business of fixing social problems. That's before they get to the cockpit. And I, I just have a an issue that this DEI thing can and probably is being taken literally to lower standards. I know that just sends people into the roof, but apparently it's being misused in that regard for virtue signaling. That because of all these problems that are occurring, that there's just like some retail stores are doing away with their DEI programs. Uh, I'm wondering, is something like this is going to be having a second look at, do we really want to have DE, diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to the public safety? Right, because I think DEI, again, it's, I think it's a cool idea. I mean, you can't argue that, that the concept is cool, but where it's taken literally to fix social problems that are outside the purview of the company, and apparently that's what it is in some places. You know, they're just bragging about stuff like that. Uh, I have a problem with that. It's, it's misusing and abusing the concept. I remember uh, a while back, I think Pete Buttigieg, who's Secretary of Transportation, was talking about how they were in need of ATC, air traffic controllers, because they didn't have enough. Is that still the case as it is now, or are they still have a shortage? No, this is perennial. This is one of the areas we have to give politicians credit. It's wonderfully bipartisan incompetence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we testified to Congress, myself and a Captain Mike Beata, who was with United Airlines, we put out a study. We testified to Congress on this in 1994 about exactly the same thing. Controllers not being trained properly, not being hired, shortages. You know, that was, you know, 30 years ago, and we're still messing with this. The problem we have is there's a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. And um, to get around that action, we're going to have to pour some, a lot more money into training and getting people. Keep in mind, when you get hired as a controller right off the street or from a college program, it's two, three years before you ever get to a live screen. The training is incredible. The job is incredible. They have to retire at 57 if they haven't died already from the job. It's a rotten job, but we've had this problem for, for years and it just hasn't been addressed. Clear something up for me, Mike, because I have been told, and I'd love to find out if this is true or not, but the Air Traffic Controller Union, uh, what is it, NATCA, um, said that, let's say, and I'll say a hypothetical, let's say if you're an air traffic controller in LaGuardia, and uh, they need air traffic controllers at JFK, their union says that you, you can't go from one airport to the other that's needed, where you may have an overflow in one but not enough in the other, that you have to hire more. Well, everybody will say, sure, let's hire more, but if you need to go. Is there, is it a union concern that you can't go from one airport to the other? I don't, hasn't gotten to that. I mean, the fact is, every place is short. New York control centers are apparently 54 percent of what they should be. So, um, you know, union games like that haven't come into the program yet because we don't have enough controllers anyway. Because it seems to me that more people are flying today than at any time ever before. So are they, are they not able to keep up with the demand and that there's not enough, not enough flights, not enough aircraft? Keep in mind, it's not how many people are flying, it's how many airplanes are in the sky. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we go through this stuff every Thanksgiving. The, the skies are crowded. It's no more crowded than the week before. You know, you have just more people on the airplane itself. And for the controller, whether it's one passenger or 300, it's all the same. But the fact of the matter is we do not have enough controllers right now. We don't have enough capacity to handle the demand 
in the Northeast, for example. You know, and, and Buttigieg will say, well, they'll, they'll, just, we'll just make them use bigger airplanes. That doesn't work. What would you say is the reason or the way that they can, they can solve this? Is it better pay? Is it better working conditions? Yeah, keep in mind, in fairness to the FAA, I mean, it's one of these organizations in the government. If you want to have a, you know, order pens or pencils, there's a huge procurement mess. Mm -hmm. That's one of the problems you have getting, getting equipment in. That's one of the problems you have hiring people. And don't kid yourself, you know, DEI notwithstanding, the, that system at, at the FAA has been politicized way too much in the past. We've got to take that out of it. And we've got to just simply say we need, you know, 500 more air traffic controllers by, you know, 2025. Let's get going on it now. I don't think we're there yet. Because of the fact that we're talking about Washington, D.C., which in itself is political, that it's, it's still going to continue the same problem over and over again? Yeah, here's the problem with the FAA. The FAA administrator more or less is there watching it run. You know, we, we had a, a prior appointee, Phil Washington, who's, you know, he runs the airport in Denver, whatever. But when he was interviewed by, or by, by the Congress, he had no idea what he wanted to do. None. And Mr. Whitaker, I haven't seen a lot of him. We need somebody who walks into the FAA and says, excuse me, I don't fly an airplane. I don't fix airplanes. I fix organizations like this one, and I'm going to shake it like a dead chicken. Here's what has to happen, A, B, C, and D. We haven't had that. We just have people say, I'm going to sit there and work with this great team at the FAA. We need somebody to go in there, you know, equipped with a Caterpillar bulldozer ready to be used. I mean, we're talking about airlines and we're talking about jets and when it comes to commercial jet makers there's Boeing and then there's Airbus and it would seem to me like what we're talking about as far as the uh, airline traffic beginning having becoming more and more congested I mean is there room well, I would think that with supply and demand why is there not more airline jet makers more than just Boeing and and, and Airbus oh money to design an airplane from scratch is several billion dollars just to design it. And, you know, we had Bombardier up in Canada. They built the, the, the best, called the a, uh, now it's called the A220 Airbus owns it. Uh, we have Embraer in Brazil, but they don't have the wherewithal to come out with a much larger airplane than the 120-seater they have now. And, of course, we have China, which, you know, having grown up in Taiwan, I'm totally embarrassed by these clowns. In, in China, what they put out is absolutely an embarrassment because uh, we just don't have companies around the world that want to put money into something that may not make money. And you're talking about billions of dollars to design a brand new airplane. Because it takes billions to design the plane, that's why a new company wouldn't want to come into the market and try to challenge both Boeing and Airbus? One did, called Bombardier up in Canada. And the Canadians, not really knowing the business real well, had the grand idea, we're going to bring out something better than anybody else. And they did. Unfortunately, they just didn't have the wherewithal to sell it around the world. And Airbus bought it. It's called the A220. And the Canadians went in there with the idea, we're going to blow away the world and hit it out of the, out of the park. And they did. They just didn't have the wherewithal to be able to market it around the world. Airbus is doing that now. At Boeing, the CEO is is Dave Calhoun, and when he took over, I want to say 2019, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think he took over from the CEO was Dennis Millenberg, uh, and Dennis was let go. I don't really remember why, but do you see Dave Calhoun's job in jeopardy right now? It should be in jeopardy. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. you know, we've had time after time with the Max coming out not being screwed together properly. Now, keep in mind, Calhoun just didn't show up. He's been on the board for years. Mm -hmm. So he, he knows the company. And this latest thing clearly shows that they need somebody at the top that really is going to shake the place. And honestly, I don't want the job myself. I, I got a lot of respect for him taking it, but he ain't doing it. And I'm sorry. I, you know, when, when you saw how he's responded, I mean, what did he say? There was an escape from quality. What kind of a MBA from Harvard gave him that concept. It's like, you know, wardrobe malfunction at the, at the Super Bowl. I mean, he's not talking straight right now. And we have to have somebody who's going to go in there and say, I'm fixing this company. And right now, there are, I don't know if you saw it, there was just now a waiver, give, a waiver not given to Boeing because there's a problem with the de-icing system on the cowls or the engines or whatever that can cause major problems. 
And Boeing said, we'll fix it in you know, a year and a half. And finally, the FAA said, no, you won't. That's going to be another major delay. So Calhoun has a lot of problems going forward. And I just wish he'd stop saying, well, we made a mistake. No, you made a bad airplane. You know, deal with that. Well, normally in a, in a corporate setting, the board oversees the CEO. I'm not familiar with the board of, of Boeing. Is it a good board? Is it just a, are they, is, as some boards can be good and some boards, as you know, can be yes men or yes people that they'll just go ahead and sign off whatever, whatever the, the chairman wants and, and, or the CEO. I'm not familiar with it, but I'm familiar with the fact that the stock is tanked. Mm -hmm. We had the issue with the Max, which had a design flaw. The board needs to really start thinking about more than just the stock price, and they need to really think beyond that to think, what is the future of keeping this company alive? What about mergers, Mike? Uh, you know, you've got recently JetBlue was going to be merging uh, with Spirit. And uh, that's right now, as, as we speak, is in doubt. Uh, JetBlue, it sounds like they want out. Spirit is still going, no, 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 we want to we want to continue staying back in. Are the smaller airlines able to compete against the big boys that a merger has to be in existence for for them to stay afloat? Well, let's put this in context. This is not like the mergers we saw in the 1980s, which were mm -hmm. anti-competitive. They were a disaster. TWA and Ozark never should have merged. You know, uh, Piedmont and USA never, but they did. Okay, that's over. That took out competition. What JetBlue and Spirit were doing, JetBlue just wanted to buy the assets. They wanted the 170 some airplanes, the other 200 that were on order at at Spirit. Spirit is what we call an impulse carrier. There's a low $79 fare from Manchester, New Hampshire to Orlando. Hey, cancel the new kitchen. We're going to Orlando. That's a different air transportation system. It should have been approved because it that, that second impulse carrier system isn't working as well as it is. And take a look at Spirit standing alone, and they're good people there. They try, they're trying to clean things up. But the fact of the matter is that wasn't a merger so much it was an asset buy. Alaska Hawaiian. That is in the consumer's best interest. Hawaiian's done a great job getting profitable or getting close to profitable, but when you're depending only on one market, leisure market to Hawaii, and a fire in, in Maui can, can kill your traffic, this merger, if you will, is access or Alaska buying them simply covers more of their overhead. They're not really going to put the two carriers together. Both those agreements should have been approved, but one's down and one to go. You know, it seems to me that more passengers today are unruly, you know, fights in the airplanes, uh, uh, they're, uh, they're getting irritable. Is it always been going on, but now with people that have cameras that they're more, and with social media, they're taking pictures and then they're putting it on media, on the media. Is it always been going on, but we're, we're now just seeing it? Keep in mind, anytime there's an altercation in an airplane, it's like, you know, Taylor Swift has showed up. Everybody brings out their cameras and starts <laughs> shooting stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, and again, there's been other things where literally a couple airlines out there, I'm going to say names, it's almost like Monty Hall, let's make a deal to fly. <laughs> oh, you want to check a bag? It's this. Oh, you want to see it? It's this. You want to get it early? It's that. Why make it so complicated? And another thing is, you know, when I started, you know, at, on the ramp at LaGuardia for American Airlines, you know, Years ago, there were certain rules. You said, hello, sir. How to, Mr. Smith, how are you today? Thank you for flying with it. You don't get that today. I mean, you're just lucky to get in line. I mean, it, it's, they say they're trying, but, and some carriers do a great job. Delta does an incredible job, by the way. I don't really work for them, but I'm just telling you the truth. But overall, some of these carriers, when you're, when you're hiring carpetbaggers to do your customer service, you're hiring Fred's ground handling service to check in your passengers, Fred and the company don't care if you ever fly Frontier again. And that's where you run into trouble. You know, whether you fly for them, they'll just go for the cheapest fare. Well, you know, and keep in mind with these ULCCs, these impulse carriers like, you know, Allegiant, which does a great job, but you got Frontier, you got Spirit, whatnot. Brand loyalty doesn't come into it. I mean, because take a look. I mean, take Frontier comes in and out of markets. You know, it's, it's like a revolving door. And I have no criticism of that, but you can't get brand loyalty. The brand loyalty is whether the fare is $79 and whether or not I really do want to go to Punta Gorda this week. But, you know, they're after the, the discretionary traveler, you know, the impulse traveler. That's real different than what American Airlines is going after. Mike, I got a lot more questions. I hope you come back. I am honored to be here, sir. You got the number. Dial at any time.
Thank you, Mike. Hey, if, if you've got a question, maybe a comment about the show, we want to hear from you. Make it concise, make it pithy, and write us at andre at benacapital.com. And now for a wrap-up on Wall Street. So join us next week when we talk on how to invest and make more in 24 with the Chief Investment Officer of Raymond James, Larry Adam. And finally tonight, we here at Wall Street Wrap-Up always strive to bring you entrepreneurship and capitalism, such as Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. Well, today, we bring you Janet Yamanaka Mello. Now, Janet, in the last seven years, has earned in her business $100 million. Now, what did Janet Mello do to make $100 million, you may ask? She worked as a civilian financial program manager for the U.S. Army. Janet set up a bogus business called Child Health and Youth Lifelong Development to siphon over $100 million from the Army and taxpayer funds over the last six years. Now, she still would not have been found out by the U.S. Army if the $100 million didn't even register, didn't even raise suspicion, but it was only caught by the IRS when she registered it on her personal income tax returns. Now, her purchases included 31 different homes in Colorado, Maryland, New Mexico, Texas, and Washington. And Janet owns over 80, 80, 80 different automobiles, including a Rolls-Royce, no word if there were any EVs, but jewelry. And also, she had $18 million sitting in cash and sitting in six different accounts controlled by her. Now, you'll be happy to know that Janet has been released without bail, but did, did say that she will likely have to sell some of her luxury possessions to reimburse the officials. Now, if you thought all of what I'm telling you is amazing, the best is yet to come, because Janet Mello will be receiving her full retirement benefits while working with the government. <laughs> According to the Army spokesman, the command has no authority to impact Ms. Mello's retirement benefits. In fact, the Army has said that Janet Mello has earned her retirement from the government, and they really don't see how one thing is related to the other. Now, by the way, just on a side note, April 15th is coming soon, so make sure you get your income taxes filed. The government needs our money. And that's a wrap-up on Wall Street Wrap-Up. Our thanks to Mike Boyd for being with us tonight, but as always, we appreciate you for allowing us into your homes this evening. Have a fun weekend with the ones you love. Remember, if it's Friday, it's Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. Always remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Wall Street Wrap-Up is supported by Bamboulas, featuring live music. And now, tapas and wine upstairs. Bamboulas, the heartbeat of Frenchman Street.